Good. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Good Vibration Seminar Series. Uh, we are here this morning for the 13th seminar of the second season. Uh, and we are very happy to welcome Alejandro Ramon da Yesta as our speaker today. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, let Antonio talk about it in a few uh, uh, seconds. But first, I just wanted to say that, uh, so we are currently uh, thinking uh, about the opportunity to continue with this series. So uh, if you are strongly opini opinionated about the subject, uh, don't hesitate to, to put a, a message in the chat and tell us if you think that it is an absolutely necessary initiative or if the, uh, the, the fact that we start again the, the conferences, you think that uh, now uh, it's, it's less necessary than before. So uh, listen carefully to the talk, but if you have five seconds, <laughs> then leave us a message in, in the chat. Um, so now I will leave the floor to Antonio uh, to introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, thank you, Rita. And thank you all for coming to or for being here today. So we have uh, Alejandro Ramon Ballesta and I will brief introduce him before he, he start the presentation. Uh, Alejandro, in any case, you can start sharing your screen and your presentation. So uh, Alejandro took his uh, degree in physics at the University of Granada in 2004. And then he started to look for, for a job. And in 2008, uh, he started to work in the Instituto de Astrofísica Andalucía, uh, but as an optics engineer, and there he was uh, head of the optics section section of the Observatory de Sierra Nevada here in Granada also. And he uh, led the design, assembly, and integration and verification of the exposure metal subsystem for the Carmenes spectrograph. Um, so after that period in 2017, uh, Alejandro uh, uh, got his uh, master degree at the Valencian International University, um, also in, in, in Spain. And uh, during uh, his master thesis, uh, I and Juan Carlos Suarez supervised him uh, in the project and uh, had to say that this, uh, his work led to a publication uh, uh, who was published in 2019, Alejandro, or 2020. I remember exactly the, the, the year. Uh, but, 21, 21. Ah, in 21, okay. So in 21. And then in 2019, you start to the PhD at the IAA also, under the supervision of uh, the professor Rafael Garrido and Javier Pascual Ganado. Now he is starting his fourth year and he will speak about his uh, project and the time frequency analysis he's uh, trying to do of uh, Delta Scuti star. So uh, Alejandro, when you want, you can start. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Um, so today I will uh, speak about the time frequency analysis of delta scuti light -like curves using wavelet transform. Wavelet transform, sorry. Uh, first, I will do uh, a brief introduction about uh, wavelet theory. Then I will show you some results uh, that we got uh, with some uh, stars, and uh, I will end with the conclusions and will uh, will uh, outline uh, the future work I have planned. So to start with the wavelet uh, concepts, uh, a wavelet is a, a function, a finite function uh, that uh, looks like a, a, a chunk of a wave. <coughs> uh, there are multiple shapes that can be considered a, a wavelet. Each of, of this sh uh, of this shape defines a family, and uh, we call the the the, the function uh, that. Uh, uh, gives the, the main shape uh, the model wavelet. 
uh, when we want to perform a wavelet analysis we should be using a shape uh, similar to this signal we want to analyze because it wouldn't make sense to correlate a square wavelet for example with a sinusoidal uh, signal they, they wouldn't correlate at all the mother wavelet uh, please don't be afraid by, by the equation i'm going only using uh, three or four of them and, and just to, to for uh, to show them, uh, there's nothing to, to do with them. Uh, <coughs> this mother wavelet can be scaled and shifted through the, through the, through the signal, uh, thus generating the, the daughter wavelets. These daughter wavelets are the, the, the tool we use to, to analyze the signal. And uh, the, all the wavelets must uh, comply with an admissibility condition, which basically is that the Fourier transform of the wavelet at the zero point is uh, must be zero. <coughs> to study natural processes, the, the most common used uh, family of wavelets is the Monlet wavelet. Uh, Jan Monlet was, was a geophysicist uh, that in the early 80s developed uh, the, 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 the theory of the wavelet uh, transform uh, to study uh, uh, seismic waves. So for astroseismology, in principle, uh, the the, the Monlet wavelets should be should be uh, suitable for, for to do the job. <coughs> uh, it's also used in studying electrocardiograms or brain waves, so it's it's widely used this this one. The expression that defines uh, the wavelet is this one. Uh, again, don't panic. Uh, the important thing here is this sigma parameter that appears in in some places because it's the trade-off between the temporal and frequency resolution. Uh, with higher sigmas we get better uh, frequency re uh, resolution at the cost of losing temporal resolution and on the contrary with, uh, with lower sigmas <coughs> we, get, we would get better temporal resolution but uh, in the end we would lo uh, lose uh, all the frequency resolution. Uh, as we said uh, the, the, the modern wavelet should be similar to the, to the uh, uh, signal we want to analyze and if we compare the shapes <coughs> of uh, the, mo the Morlet wavelet and uh, uh, light curve uh, we can see that they uh, look quite alike so again uh, this uh, uh, we think this is a, a good choice then we're going to go to the analysis so we define the continuous wavelet transform and I promise this is the last equation I will show uh, <coughs> uh, which is the convolution of the daughter wavelets with the signal we want to analyze. And there is a very nice video I want to show you about how this analysis works. Okay, let's let it begin again. <coughs> so we start with a small wavelet, we correlate it with the signal, then we change, uh, we stretch it, we correlate it again, and, and so on. So in the end, we have a, a, a diagram uh, of uh, the scales versus the displacement. This, this uh, Jacopo Bertolotti did this, this animation and he used sigma as, a, as the, the scale parameter. Is this is not the sigma uh, I defined earlier in the in the Morley wavelet equation. And this is this is what we call a. <coughs> Let's back to the presentation. So from the last frame of the of the GIF, uh, this GIF is is released into the public domain. By the way, you can find it in in, in Jacopo Bertolotti Twitter and, and also in, in in Wikipedia, I think. Uh, once we have this this uh, diagram, we can plot it in a into a two D uh, plot, uh, converting the 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 scales into frequencies uh, and somehow that we'll see in a uh, in a wee moment. And uh, of course, the displacement is the time. And if we represent the power of the coefficients using a, a, a color bar and, and uh, arbitrary units. We get this nice plot, which uh, will be the basis of our analysis. We'll see a lot of them today. Well, uh, now that we have this plot, uh, I have to say that this is just a, a small uh, piece of the of the analysis. If you take the whole the whole range, the 
the the maximum frequency we can uh, sample is uh, half the, the 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 sampling frequency of the signal because of the nickest uh, criteria. So this is important to to know uh, for for later. So the transform is called continuous because the scale and the shifting can take any value. It has nothing to do with the continuous Fourier transform uh, uh, in, in this meaning. So this is the transform we use to analyze uh, discrete signals. Uh, this transform is uh, completely invertible. We can we can retrieve the the signal uh, from the coefficients. Uh, the signal must be equally sampled, so we must have a constant uh, sampling frequency, and this in light curves uh, isn't always uh, possible because uh, we most uh, we will most likely uh, will have uh, gaps in them. So we must fill the gaps before analyzing them. In our case, we use the, the Nyarma interpolation algorithm developed by Pascual Granada and collaborators in, in 2015. Then, as I said earlier, we have to mm, transform the scale into frequencies. Um, at this point, there are many forms of, 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 uh, of doing this transformation, and this is the reason uh, we should talk uh, more about pseudo frequency, more than frequency. Uh, in our case, uh, the most common uh, uh, way of, of transforming a scale into frequency is to fit a wave into the wavelet and uh, the frequency of the wave that best fits the central frequency of the wavelet is uh, what we call the, the frequency of the wavelet. Once we define this frequency, we, we can start talking about frequencies. And we forget uh, the, the pseudo, the pseudo uh, part of them. One characteristic of this uh, uh, scale versus frequency transformation is that uh, the, the they relate in an inverse power law. <coughs> so uh, for lower frequencies, we have a lot of scales to scan them, but for higher frequencies, uh, we have a few, a few uh, very few uh, frequent, uh, scales that can sample it. So, it's intrinsic to this method that we have better resolution at low frequencies than uh, at higher frequencies. What we call uh, low and high frequencies depend on the frequency sampling. This is just an example, but uh, if, if we have a different uh, uh, frequency sampling, these this numbers will change, and um, low frequencies will be the ones that fall under the, the less steep slope of the curve and high frequencies would be the ones that fall in the asymptotic uh, uh, part. To compare the wavelet transform with uh, other uh, more known uh, uh, techniques, the, for example the, the short time uh, Fourier transform, we can see that the window that the uh, wavelet transform uses is uh, kind of dynamic, so it adapts itself to the frequencies. High, uh, higher frequencies need lower uh, window, uh, uh, smaller windows in, in, in terms of time and uh, lower frequencies uh, need uh, a longer window. And, and this is done uh, <coughs> automatically, uh, automatically by, by the method. Uh, in the, the short time frequencies we fix the window before the doing the analysis. So this could be an advantage of the, of the wavelength transform over the, the more classical approach. And uh, uh, when we do our analysis, we had to find the best sigma, which uh, I remember you was the trade-off between the frequency as the as the temporal resolution, because uh, with lower sigmas we can lose information about the frequencies. This is the same star, the same uh, light curve, analyzed with two different sigmas, and we can see that uh, when sigma is low, the frequencies that are in this uh, zone are a kind of uh, mask uh, by each other so uh, we have to to test several sigmas before uh, deciding which one is the best for for light curve and another thing uh, that is in it's interesting to do is to split the analysis into the into several regions because if we do the analysis in the whole region the strongest frequencies uh, because of the way we represent the the plots the strongest frequencies can can uh, hamper the, the, the visual uh, 
<coughs> inspection of the of the more more weak frequency. So it's better to do uh, small uh, small analysis and, and to split the, the analysis in, in several parts. And uh, uh, as a last thing of this wavelength transform, we can integrate over time the, the, the results, and we will get then we will get the the the, the frequency uh, versus uh, power uh, plot. So we can identify the peaks and where are the, the main frequencies. Um, as you can see, there is a background noise a noise uh, that is increasing with the frequency. This is one of the drawbacks uh, of the of the counterparts of this of this analysis. Another one is that sometimes, especially with the higher frequencies, the the lines are too wide. So if there were more than one frequency in this region, we wouldn't be able to to see it. <coughs> That's why uh, Dobshi de developed a method to uh, reallocate. The, the coefficients uh, around a central frequency by looking into the phases of them. Uh, <coughs> it was originally intended for some ways, but uh, the, the use has been extended again for, for, other <coughs> for other studies. And as, uh, some ways are quite similar to, to like curves in, in fact, well, uh, we think it's, it's a good idea to use it. Uh, <coughs> the signal can still be reconstructed from the noise coefficient, so we don't lose uh, information. And uh, as a result, improves uh, frequency resolution. And lucky, is, uh, lucky for us, and there is a Python package quite quite useful to do this, this task. So, from uh, a plot with wide uh, frequency uh, bands, we go into a plot with uh, more resolved frequencies. And uh, as you can see, for example, in this part, uh, the, the second frequencies uh, get, get resolved. This uh, wobbling uh, effect is due to the uh, to the to the fact that the, the as we are in the high part of the of the frequencies versus scale uh, diagram, uh, there is an an exact uh, scale that matches this frequency. So this is like a, a pattern of interference of uh, a wavelength at almost this uh, this uh, frequency and uh, and this produces this this effect but it has a, it has nothing to do with the with the with the signal itself uh, one uh, drawback of the of the synchrotron crease is the this uh, kind of ghost lines that uh, are part of the of the uh, are artifacts of the algorithm <coughs> if we integrate the synchrotron increased plot over time, we see that the noise gets uh, reduced and the, the peaks are narrower and are better defined. So this is the, the analysis we'll be performing uh, in, in, in with our stars. Apart this of this analysis, we have tried other approaches using uh, wavelengths as well. Uh, and such as the script wireless transform that uses uh, selected scales only. This can be used as a, as a bandpass filter to, to decompose the signal into high and low uh, frequencies uh, uh, components. So if we have a, a low frequency signal with a high frequency noise, we can use these uh, wavelets packets, that's what uh, they are called, to decompose the signal into the low frequency uh, components and the, and the high uh, frequency noise. In this sense, if we wanted to, to reduce the noise, we could simply erase this, this part and reconstruct the signal using the low frequency samples. Um, one of the problems that this, met this uh, method has is that the uh, signal gets downsampled. Although there is a, a, a version that uh, doesn't do this downsampling, but uh, of course, we duplicate the number of uh, of data to, to to treat. The downsampling method is called decimation in this. So this is a technical issue, a technical matter. Only. This uh, discrete wireless transform is mainly used for noise filtering and signal compression. In and if we do uh, the same thing uh, along several iteration, uh, I mean, I, we decompose then the signal into high and low frequencies and this other, and so on. We got what is called the wavelength packet decomposition. 
which is we, uh, what we can see here. It's it's uh, quite used in the in neurosciences. It's not used in in, in other uh, sciences, but it could be also useful. Uh, one of the advantages that this decomposition has is that uh, in the end we have <coughs> equally spaced uh, frequency bands. So uh, from a signal uh, that goes uh, on a from a in, in a frequency range, we would we will have in the end. Uh, mm, well, depending on the level of decomposition, two to the to the levels, <laughs> uh, uh, sub signals uh, with the information in the in the of the frequencies in that band. These uh, bands overlap a bit, uh, and that could be a problem when when doing this because if we have a frequency in the overlapping section, section, when we split the 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 signal. We will have the frequency split as well, so uh, it, it, will, will, it will produce an aliasing effect. This is the basis for the multi resolution anal analysis using wavelets. Uh, as I said, uh, we have equally spaced frequency bands. We avoid the problem of the, of the inverse power law. But because of this overlapping thing, we can have aliases. And uh, as, as higher the L uh, goes, uh, especially if you use the undecimated, or so, uh, I mean the, the the version that doesn't don't sample the signal, the the, the use of resources gets uh, overkill. So <coughs> uh, um, I've in several tests I've done, uh, I've been able to reach 12 or 13 levels, but uh, when I try to reach the next one, the the computer just crashes because it runs out of the of the of, rec of resources, it runs out of memory and, and this space. So uh, we will stick with the synchro squeeze, uh, uh, the mm, <coughs> um, transform, and and we will forget uh, about this wavelet target decomposition uh, for now. So let's see some results. Um, excuse me. First, we have uh, studied uh, the stars HD174936 and uh, 174966 uh, because they are stars that have been uh, studied for a long time in a group. For example, Garcia Hernandez and Colaborator studied them in 2009 and 2013. And uh, in, the, in my master's third thesis, I also studied them in the, and, and published the result in the paper that Antonio mentioned earlier. We have taken the light curves from Coro, so we have 27 days because they come from the short run. We have filled the gaps with uh, the Miarma algorithm I mentioned earlier. <coughs> and we have uh, generated synthetic light curves uh, using the frequencies extracted by uh, Garcia Hernandez and Kroberters in 2009-2013 in order to have something to compare. Uh, because uh, as is, this is the first time we use this uh, wavelet technique, we wanted to be sure that what we were getting uh, was uh, uh, was real and not uh, an artifact of the of the method. Uh, in particular, for uh, one, um, 936, we use the 30 160 first uh, frequencies to r to generate the synthetic signal. And for 966, we use the uh, 21st frequencies. This is because the DRMS the decays much faster in this star than in 936. So we need less frequencies to uh, explain the variations we see in the in the light curve. And uh, these results are, are being published uh, right now. We, we have a paper accepted and, and will be published uh, soon, I guess. So, uh, to start with uh, 174936, uh, this is the light curve, uh, the actual light curve, and this is the simulated light curve. The overall uh, wave uh, synchro squeeze uh, transform analysis shows that the, there are uh, uh, a main frequency and a number one uh, above them. And then in the, in the low frequencies regions, there are some uh, frequencies as well. If we take a close look at the at the main frequencies, we see that there is this uh, wiggling. This is due to the to the sigma selection um, of of the of the wavelet 
uh, we've tried several sigmas and we can get rid uh, of it it's probably because there are more there is more than one frequency here that the wavelet is incapable of, of resolve so when the the simple squeeze algorithm is is applied it, it can decide which which frequency which which is the the central frequency and uh, this could be also the the reason for this uh, for this uh, behavior here in this in this another frequency in fact if we compare the synchro squeeze uh, transform with the wavelet transform with simple wavelet transform we see that the wavelet coefficients kind of overlap in some region this is most likely what is hampering the 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 synchro squeeze uh, uh, transform in the lower part of the of the spectrum we have a much better resolution and uh, we found an interesting uh, uh, feature that is in at this uh, frequency in particular which in the in the synthetic uh, spectrum uh, looks quite stable <coughs> Uh, in the actual light curve, uh, it seems like uh, the, the signal isn't almost there and then uh, suddenly appears. Uh, this, this end uh, 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 wobbles, uh, uh, by the way, are due to uh, what is called the border effect, as uh, the, they are produced by the, by the wavelet transform itself, because uh, the wavelet transform looks for changes into the, into the signal, and the beginning and the end of the signal is a change. So uh, this is how it reflects uh, this this thing. <coughs> but uh, as I said, uh, for us the most interesting thing is that the, uh, there is a change uh, of behavior between the actual light curve and the synthetic light curve. Uh, we've thought a bit about the causes of, of that could modulate this this frequency. Uh, the, could be uh, a magnetic field uh, modulating the frequency somehow, or uh, maybe a transient of, of, of a planet or of, or of another star. <coughs> but uh, we have to look deeper into the possible uh, physical causes. Then in 966, we have done the same analysis. Uh, again, we have the actual light curve and the uh, synthetic curve. The overall uh, plot looks quite the same in the light curve and in the synthetic. If we take a look at the at the main frequencies, they look almost the same. So the analysis we think is good. And again, in the low frequencies part, uh, there is a frequency that is very stable in the in the in the synthetic part, which is what we should expect. But in the uh, light curve. There is a modulation and uh, the frequency disappears uh, a couple of times. Again, uh, uh, we have to to uh, look deeper into the physical uh, meaning of this, uh, because it could be also a, a magnetic field or 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 some other uh, unknown uh, physics that we haven't taken into account in the in this type of stars. Um, <coughs> It's worth noticing that uh, we have a run of uh, 27 days, which uh, maybe a bit short, maybe for for uh, for low for low frequencies. Uh, but as uh, in the synthetic curve, uh, the things look uh, okay. We think that uh, with 27 days is okay to to have enough resolution and. Therefore, we think that this is an intrinsic uh, uh, characteristic of the of the star. We uh, uh, have in progress uh, the study of of other stars as well, uh, with KIC five nine five zero seven five nine, using Kepler data. Uh, Bowman and Kravitz found that there is amplitude and frequency modulation, <coughs> so we we want to study this star. I will show you the general plot for for these stars, but I will not go into details yet because we are we are currently working on, on them. Then uh, uh, HD one eight one five 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 is also studied in our group, and uh, uh, with this other star with a long name, uh, <coughs> it, it was claimed to be a, a hybrid uh, gamma Doradus and Delta Scuti star. So. 
uh, we are interested in the in the lower frequencies that we define this hybrid uh, uh, nature because precisely the lower frequencies are the one uh, that we get uh, the, the the better resolution in. so the general plot of uh, of the first star is this one uh, as you can see because of the frequency sample the all the frequencies lie in the in the highest frequency range for, for, this, for this sampling frequency so uh, we'll have to see if, if we have enough resolution to, to, to see the, the modulations that Roman uh, did uh, this one star is very interesting because he, it has uh, a lot of frequencies in the middle and in the low region and uh, last uh, the, the, hybrid, uh, the hybrid star we can uh, barely see here the the, the low frequencies uh, plotted, <coughs> but uh, I think uh, we'll get some interesting results uh, here as well. So, in conclusion, uh, the study of HD 174, 936, and 966 uh, reveals the the high potential of the of the synchrosquiz transform uh, to study frequency variations in the light curves. Uh, the, as I said uh, several times, the the, the synchronous transforms show better results in the low frequency region than in the high frequencies, and, and and these low and high frequencies are defined by the by the sampling frequencies in uh, in, the, in the end. The the use of the continuous wavelet transform without synchro squeezing is also uh, useful to identify possible of artifacts of the synchro squeezing algorithm. <coughs> and the adaptive window say size size uh, makes the synchronous quiz transfer more suitable uh, for time frequency study the study than, than for example the, the short time for the transfer at least in the in the low frequency region uh, the variation that we have found uh, we consider that they are intrinsic to the stars so uh, the, the method is again uh, useful and uh, we'll if possible, it, it would be advisable to have more observations of these stars with longer runs <coughs> to confirm uh, the, the, the unstable nature of, of these frequencies. In the future, we plan to extend the analysis to a large selection of stars. Uh, we also uh, will look deeper in, into the physical causes if for the frequency modulation if, if we found uh, more of these uh, features. Uh, I plan to develop an automatic routine uh, to identify the peaks and perform the analysis uh, because uh, right now the, 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 sp the splitting of the plots is, is done by, by hand but I think uh, it should be easy to identify the peaks and, and draw the plots around them and uh, uh, to, to finish uh, in, in this autumn I will be releasing a, a, a short stay in Toulouse with François Lignier uh, to apply this uh, wavelet analysis to the study of magnetic activity in, in, in A stars. We have already had a, a, a meeting and we think that there is a good synergy within our groups. Uh, so I hope we will get some interesting uh, results as well. And that's all. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Ale, uh, Alejandro. I, uh, I thought you, you went fast. <laughs> <laughs> As I know, so we have some time for questions or comments. If anyone wants to make a question or comment, uh, if no one wants to make a question, I have a question. Ale, I see in the yes. okay. Uh, yeah, I will. I will make the question, and then Dominic will make you. Uh, I was thinking okay. about your, the the forty slide. 40. 40 yeah let me look for it 40 yes yeah. um so you have the simulated uh, uh light curve and you have the, the synchro squeeze the, the real light curve yes. um, um, i was wondering if those less significant frequencies that you can see in the simulated like very constant or yes, yeah yes, pretty yes, clear yes. yeah but in the in in the real signal they it's like they are changing some energy at around the, the um, 
2076 days or so. Yeah. So they change on like the frequency mix. I don't know if this is trustable or this is real a real thing. But what do you think about this? Yeah, we think that there could be a modulation between between these frequencies because it, it looks like when when the, the main frequency disappears, the, the mm -hmm. this one uh, gets stronger. <clears throat> So maybe there is a, there is a, a relationship between them. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, for example, standard uh, analysis of the modulation could be also interesting and to check mm -hmm. if you can infer some information. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. So, Dominic, go ahead. Hi, Alejandro. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so that, that was my comment, but my question um, is how sensitive are you to the gap filling algorithm? Because for example, Coro stars and test stars have very different cadences and instrumental gaps and, and their noise properties are quite different. So can you, uh, can you please elaborate on, on how sensitive you are to the gap filling? Well, um... Uh, for these stars, uh, the gap film uh, it doesn't seem to have any effect at all. Uh, then we've tried uh, this in this one. If if you look deeper, uh, it seems that the the regions where we have filled the gaps, there is uh, it's like a, uh, there is a different noise, so it's it's kind of distinguishable. <clears throat> so uh, if the gap filling affects the the analysis, uh, it definitely shows in the the, the plot. So we, we can uh, easily mm, distinguish if, if there is an effect or not. So can can you use that to to somehow put a limit on on how big a gap can be before it becomes um, unwieldy to to fill the gap? Is it is it yes. one data point? Is it ten data points? How how large is that gap? Well, it depends on the signal, uh, but uh, we haven't done uh, simulations on that mm, because we didn't feel it uh, necessary as long as, as we are aware of, 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 of the ability of detecting the gap if, if something weird happens. Okay, uh, then I would encourage you to do those simulations for test data because it's, it's very different for Coro data. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. So, anyone else have some questions, comments for Alejandro? Well, either everything is clear or you didn't understand anything. <laughs> That's what's worst. <laughs> no, no, I think it was pretty clear. At, the, at least the first part were more complicated, but I think that uh, you have a nice plus. I also have uh, uh, another question. In, I think it's the 20 or slide or something around that. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so the 20, I think, yes, the 21, uh, the 20, 20 slide. 20? Yeah, you, you say here that you, you can see some artifacts that you identify and I don't know sadly how, but um, how can you distinguish the real, so the, the artifacts from the real frequencies? Do you need to do simulations or mm, you can see a clear pattern or whatever that say that this is not a real frequency? Well, uh, this, for example, this ghost uh, patterns around the frequencies happen, mm -hmm. uh, happen always uh, so this is one reason and another one is comparing the the frequencies uh, with the one obtained by the the pre-winding method which is uh, the, the the usual way to get the, the frequencies so if if this doesn't appear in the with the pre-winding uh, it's more likely to be an artifact yeah but the pre-winding is done uh, on the entire like cool right so you cannot see the variation you want to see in there. no we can see the variation but we can identify if if this peak is, is real or not <clears throat> if it's okay. in the pre-winding and also here so uh, we we may infer that it's a real frequency and it's 
there is a variation, well, we'll take it as, a, as an actual okay. variation. So these artifacts are like side lobes that can interfere between uh, frequencies that are close or something and make yeah. a signal not real. So, for, for example, a, a fake uh, frequency so here, because maybe this is related to the other question I, uh, I mentioned previously mm, for the real signal where they interfere. Oh, I don't know, I'm thinking. Mm. Well, this in particular, I think they are due to the to the edges of the of the biggest uh, mm -hmm. uh, band. Okay. Okay, Vicky has a question, so Vicky, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yes. yes hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I apologize if you answered already my question in your talk and I missed it, mm -hmm. but I was wondering, so we know from, from many Delta Scuti and Gamma Dwarf stars that there are several stars having tons of peaks, right? And we are yes. talking here hundreds in some, to some extent. Yes. So I was wondering, have you done simulations and really not working on real stars, but have you done simulations to what extent you can actually retrieve what you put in? In the sense, like you know, and how many frequencies can you can you actually re, uh, retrieve from your um, from such uh, stars or such artificial stars that have hundreds of peaks? We have done simulations, but uh, I must admit that we've not exceeded the limit of the of the mm -hmm. of, uh, number of, of frequencies. Okay, we could, I, I strongly recommend to do that because that's one of the most uh, the biggest issues we know. Also, especially from Cora, right? Uh, many years ago, yes. there was this issue with the star, uh, the first star having needing hundred uh, thousand frequencies to to fit the light curve. However, if you if you really do like traditional Fourier tr uh, analysis, um, you know you you realize that after three or four hundred peaks uh, extracted, you actually start to introduce a lot more uh, signal than than you actually extract and and frequencies that are not real so so that's why i think it would be very interesting to know to what extent you can do that i think what the limit is yeah we will test it for sure thank you thank you thank you thank you i, I had a, a question but i i cannot raise my hand as as the host <laughs> <laughs> so, <it's> okay <laughs> uh, so yes in in the same line as as vicky uh but more from from uh, i would say a person that is completely incompetent for uh, signal analysis <laughs> uh, so if we take a step back uh, and uh, if uh, you look at coro's uh, 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 power spectrum of delta scuti stars do you think that um, your analysis uh, basically helps um, explaining uh, uh, the, the peaks that that all of the sudden we we started to observe thanks to space photometry and because uh, when it happened we we started to invoke uh, like um, chaotic modes and, and things like that and I think it's a very interesting uh, um, uh, subfield that was open mm -hmm. uh, back then do you think that your analysis changes the game well it, it doesn't change the uh, the game but uh, it widens it <laughs> Because it introduces the, the variability of the fre of the frequencies. So once we know there are hundreds or, or, or so frequencies, we go one step further and, and we, we study if the frequencies are stable or uh, or not. Yeah. So yes. I think that the main idea is not to do a pre whitening but uh, just study probably the main peaks, right? Yes. Okay, that so uh, that will be very very interesting to see what uh, <laughs> will happen to those peaks. Okay, so Antonio, yeah. you think we're good? Yeah, I think no no one is commenting anything. Just Vicky send a comment in the chat saying that <laughs> she would like to see the the seminars continue. Uh, so uh, yes, and Nicola just sent uh, also. So yeah. They are encouraging us to continue the seminar. <laughs> right. Yeah, so uh, I also got a private message from Peter the Cat in the same line. So don't hesitate to 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 give us uh, your your feedback in the chat for the next few seconds. 
And I think it's time for me to, to thank uh, everyone who, who was here, virtually here today. And uh, also uh, to thank very much Alejandro for uh, uh, presenting his work uh, and uh, Antonio for uh, introducing him. So thank you very, very much for attending. Uh, and thank you uh, for en your encouraging uh, comments. <laughs> Let's see what happens. We will meet with the steering committee now and, and we will uh, uh, keep you informed of, of the, of the, of the um, future of the seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice talk, Ali. Thank you.